Hi guys and welcome back to History of Vision Success and looking at your Nazism and Democracy course. So, by 1924, the Weimar Republic had survived a series of attempted coups and revolts, both from the right and from the left. And these had been serious threats, not so much because of the strength of the various opposition groups, but because of the sense of national humiliation following the Treaty of Versailles and then the economic crisis of 1923. However, the Republic survived and entered a more stable period um, that lasted actually until 1929. On the surface, these were years of recovery and achievement. Or do they only seem successful in contrast to the turmoil of 1918 to 1923? One alternative view is that behind the superficial promise of these years, major weaknesses still existed in the Weimar Republic, weaknesses that would later contribute significantly to the downfall of democracy. So we'll now explore over the next three lessons whether the middle years of the Weimar Republic, Republic were really years of recovery, recovery and achievement. So in the summer of 1923, the problems facing the Weimar Republic came to a head. The German cur currency had collapsed and hyperinflation had set in. French and Belgian troops were occupying the Ruhr and the German government had no clear policy on the occupation except for passive resistance. And we know what detrimental effect that had. Uh, there were various left wing political disturbances across the country in Saxony, the creation of an SPD and KPD regional state government resulted in an attempted communist uprising. And the ultra conservative state government in Bavaria was defying the national government resulting in the Munich Beer Hall Putsch. Yet after a few months later, sorry, even a few months later, a semblance of normality had actually returned. The Weimar Republic's remarkable survival illustrates the telling comment of the historian D. Pukert, writing in 1987, that even 1923 shows there are no entirely hopeless situations in history. During his 103 days as Chancellor, Stresman had been responsible for stabilizing the economy, bringing in inflation under control, and defeating attempts from both the left and right to overthrow the government. Born the son of a Berlin publican, Stresman studied economics at university before going into business. And having run a successful business career, he was elected as the youngest member of the Reichstag in 1907 as a national liberal and became party leader in 1917. He was a committed monarchist and nationalist in support of the Kaiser's expansionist policies. Appalled by Germany's defeat, he hoped to create a constitutional monarchy and in 1919, he formed the DVP and opposed the Weimar Republic. However, by 1921, he faced political reality and committed himself and his party to a more constructive attitude to Weimar, seeing it as the best alternative to left or right-wing dictatorships. In, 1923, um, in the 1923 hyperinflation crisis, Stresman was made chancellor and confronted all the problems head on. Although his term in office lasted for just three months, known as Stresman's 100 days, it laid the basis for the recovery of 1924 to 9. Stresman was foreign minister in all the Weimar governments from 1923 to 9. In effect, he was the architect of Weimar foreign policy and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1926, actually, for his diplomatic efforts. He showed the strength of character and realism to negotiate with the Allies, which improved Germany's international position. Nevertheless, he failed to generate real domestic support for Weimar. Indeed, his long-term reputation remains arguable as he actually failed to revise the Versailles, Versailles Treaty fundamentally. It is also questionable whether he could have saved the Weimar Republic from Nazism and whether or not he failed to do so. It should be stressed that in 1923, things had been allowed to slide under Chancellor Kuno. Nevertheless, the appointment of Stresman as Chancellor in August 1923 resulted in the emergence of a politician who was actually prepared to take difficult political decisions. Stresman led a broad coalition of the DVP, the DDP, the ZP, and also the SPD, which was called the Great Coalition, and was the first time in the short history of Weimar to include parties from both the left and the right. 
He aimed to resolve Germany's economic plight and also tackle the problem of its weaknesses internationally. But the priority was first to bring inflation under control and he did this through three key steps. First of all, the end of passive resistance. Now passive resistance against the occupation of the Ruhr was called off in September. This was a highly unpopular and risky move, which actually led, as we've already looked at, to serious unrest and the attempted beer hall putsch in Munich. Stresemann calculated, however, that he had no alternative. Germany's economy was beginning to grind to a halt and inflation was out of control. Ending passive resistance, which meant the government stopped paying workers who refused to work for the French, was an essential first step towards reducing government expenditure. He also promised to resume reparation payments as he needed to conciliate the French in order to evoke international sympathy for Germany's economic position. Secondly, he introduced a new currency. And in November, it was uh, the currency was called or introduced called the Rentenmark, which was introduced to replace the old and now worthless Reichsmark. The new currency was exchanged for the old on the basis of one Rentenmark for one trillion old marks. And since Germany didn't have sufficient gold reserves to back the new currency, it was supported by a mortgage on all industrial and agricultural land. Once the new currency was successfully launched, the government kept tight control over the amount of money in circulation in order to prevent inflation reappearing. The old inflated marks were gradually cashed in, and in August 1924, the mark became the Reichsmark, backed by the German gold reserve, which had to be maintained at 30% of the value of the Reichsmarks in circulation. Inflation ceased to be a problem, and the value of the new currency was established at home and abroad. All of this happened under the direction of Finance Minister Holmar Schacht. Schacht had been the director of the National Bank from 1916 and was co-founder of the DDP party in November 1918. He has been described as a financial genius for the role he played in the stabilization of the German currency. And in 1923, he became the Reich currency commissioner and head of the Reich Bank and introduced the Rentenmark. He then went on to help negotiate the Dawes and the Young plans, which we'll look at later, which modified Germany's reparations payments in order to benefit Germany. He later became the economics minister under the Nazis, but actually did eventually lose favour and was removed from the Reich Bank in 1939. And thirdly, we have the balancing of the budget. Now, under the guidance of the finance minister Hans Luther, Stresemann's government sharply cut expenditure and started to raise taxes, something that they had been um, afraid of doing just after the war. Now, the salaries of government employees were cut and some uh, 300,000 civil servants lost their jobs and taxes were raised for both individuals and for companies alike. As government debt began to fall, confidence was then restored. And the years 1924 to 29 have been named by some as the golden age of the Republic, but that has been hotly contested and debated. In the case of Stresemann's economic policies, for example, these changes made, changes made a considerable difference to the way that the Germany, um, German economy operated. Yes, that's true. Well-managed companies that were um, run prudently were you know, careful um, not to build up excessive debt, um, but actually, if we have a look at it more closely, well, um, while they managed to, while the large companies managed to prosper, um, weaker companies that were heavily reliant on credit actually crumbled. And the number of companies that went bankrupt in Germany rose from 233 in 1923 to over 6,000 in 1924. Moreover, those who had lost their um, savings in the collapse of the old currency didn't gain anything from the introduction of a new currency. In which case, the evident counter argument is that not everyone benefited from these three strategies employed by Stresemann, and it is therefore quite difficult to reach an objective conclusion about the extent of stability and recovery between 1924 and 1929.